Ramon Ilanen, R-A-M-O-N, last name is Y-L-A-N-A-N, and uh, team physician for the Razorbacks? Or do you want like assistant professor at UI Mass? Team physician would be cool. Okay, uh, okay. Or, I mean, well, let's, let's go ahead and talk. Can you list out all those positions you do have? Um, well, I am assistant professor in family medicine and orthopedics at UI Mass. I'm the fellowship director for our sports medicine fellowship and then team physician for the Razorbacks. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about starting with, I think we can go back to how UAMS got involved with Razorback athletics. How did that happen? It started last January. Uh, that's when the care contract um, for the Razorbacks switched over from the previous private group here in town to UAMS. Um, I was with the previous private group up until about 2019 when I left to join UIMS and, and join West Cox and the orthopedic department here. Um, and every few years they go through contract changes with the university. Um, and the current contract was up and UIMS had put in their bid to provide care for the Razorbacks. Um, and uh, January 1 last year is when it was uh, awarded to UIMS and we've been taking care of them since. So do you think just a question, this is just curiosity, does that mean that there's a potential that UAMS this contract eventually ends and then this ends or is it something more long term? How, how does that work? No, the goal is that this is a long term relationship now between two sister institutions, between the medical school and the university as far as the uh, University of Arkansas up here. Yeah, I was, I was at the U of A when that happened, I was like, this makes sense, you know, it's all in the university system and I think it would help a lot with university students as well. Agree, agree. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, let's talk about how this does help uh, UAMS students. I mean, Arkansas football, Arkansas athletics. Yes. That's it for the state. You know, everyone's rooting for us. So how big is it that students now, and how, how do students get involved with, uh, is it, you know, this fellowship program you're talking about? How, yes. How does that work? So fellowship is basically graduate education after you've completed residency. So after medical school, you do your residency, whichever specialty you go in, and then you specialize, you subspecialize through a fellowship program. So for primary care sports medicine, you can get to us through five different pathways, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, uh, physical medicine and rehab, and emergency medicine are the five pathways through which you can join or at least have credentials to apply for the fellowship program. And then we take two fellows every year. So our current fellows, one's from Texas and one's from Kentucky. Um, and so this is our year eight for our fellowship program. That's great, that's yep. great. Um, all right, now let's go ahead and start football talk. Okay. Uh, I mean, what kind of work, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're still not even to game day, we're close, but what kind of work, and when does it start for the athletes getting you know, their bodies ready? <laughs> Uh, I don't think it ever ends, technically. Um, if you look at them getting prepared for today, it started, I mean, fall camp is when they really started, but they were going all summer. They were lifting all summer, they were conditioning all summer, they were working with the strength staff at the university. Um, they've got nutritionists on staff over there, they've got a whole army of strength and conditioning staff, plus they got their athletic trainers that keep them healthy throughout the week. So this Saturday was, we're looking at culmination of work starting in the summer. I mean, even spring camp, you know, they get done with spring football, then they get a little bit of time off, but they start going all summer. So this is just another weekend for them, but the accumulation of all that work they put in is just on Saturday game day, but it never really ends for them. And I, I've heard a lot about, and I, we've got a meteorologist, I think he used to play high school football. Um, he was telling us how the first two games are sort of the biggest game, it's kind of like, if guys haven't prepared for it, it kind of hits them at the brick wall. Hey, can you explain that process? Why does that happen? Well, I think it's just because it's the first time they're stepping on the field for game speed. Because they've been conditioning, they've been working out, and even at practice in fall camp, they're playing against each other, but they're not going out in the field and playing against somebody else. And the moment you step on the field, no matter what sport it is, it's a whole different level from practice speed, practice what you do, to putting it on the field in game time. So there's always that, the jitters, for some of the freshmen, for some of the transfers who've never played at SEC football before, stepping out on Razorback Stadium on a Saturday is intimidating. You got 75,000 plus people cheering you on, that kind of gets some folks. Um, I still get a kick out of 
sneaking out of the tunnel when we got to go. I, just, I love it. It's a blast. Um, but those first few games are always just interesting because they've never played in that environment. Now, the seniors, some of those guys, for them, yes, it's old hat, but they still get a kick out of playing in front of their fans. Yeah, I don't think that's ever no. a feeling that goes away. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let's, let's talk about, uh, so you said it, it just never stops. Yes. Are there certain things that they have to do before they get to the game? I know maybe like preparing, you know, nutritionally, maybe not eating certain things. What, what, what kind of advice do you give them? the week of or maybe the first the days before well we're really lucky uh, and not all schools are as lucky as what we've got here but there's an entire staff of nutritionists and sports nutritionists that are on campus some handle specific teams there's some that direct the entire basically meal prep for the kids from start to finish I mean that's at the Jones Center there's nutritionists that make sure what they have at the Jones Center to eat is everything they need it's tailored to what they've got to do sport wise nutrition wise um, Julia is the head nutritionist for football, and so she and her staff are there all the time. So they, she handles breakfast, lunches, dinners, uh, snacks in between, supplements that they need. Uh, so it's, and they have access to all that 24-7 whenever they need it. So for us, it's actually really, really nice because there's an entire group of folks that really just handle the nutritional status, hydration status for the kids um, to where everything's in tip-top shape come Saturday. That's great, that's good. Well, I mean, now we're kind of heading up into, let's get into yep. game day. I mean, you, it seems almost like you don't, you shouldn't do absolutely anything when it gets to game day. Do not hurt yourself, you know, yep. like have 60 people around you wherever you go so you don't get hurt. Like, what, what, what is that? What, what, what do athletes need to do on game day? Oh, just focus on game day. I mean, the nice thing again here is they've got an entire support structure of folks that are there to take care of them, get them prepared. But once the whistle blows, then it's just time to play football. Um, and so for us, really game day is a culmination of all the work that's come on in. So if they're prepared mentally, if they're prepared physically, if they're prepared nutritionally, hydration wise, then come game time, it's just them being athletes. Um, and so ideally there's nothing that they have to think about or worry about because we've taken care of it before they show on up. That's good. That's good. And you, you guys make everything easy for them. Though. They, they just... That's the goal. I mean, it's not always easy for everybody, but the goal is to find ways. I've always kind of likened uh, Division One athletes to Formula One race cars. I mean, they do what they do because they can tweak a little bit here. It's a little bit there, a little bit there, and that's the difference between winning and losing. Um, Formula One race car, if the tire pressure is a little bit off or if the wing's a little bit loose, there's little things that change the ability for that car to perform. And so you're not really making those changes on game day. Those changes were made leading up to game day so that they're ready to go and you're not making adjustments. Now, injuries will happen Thursday at practice during game day, then you have to adjust for those. But the goal is that they're coming in with their best foot forward and able to do everything that they want to do. Let now, you, you're talking about injuries. Let's talk about on the field. Okay. Um, I mean, all we, all people are seeing on TV is just, you know, what's on the field at the moment. Yep. You know, or maybe they, they're like, oh, someone's not on the field, and I kind of, like, of course, the little light bulb's like, holy crap, what's happening? But what, what are you guys doing? You know, the health doesn't stop. Correct. You know, you guys are continuing to go on. What, what are you guys worried about while you're on the field for that? Well, Every athlete that's already had an injury that we've managed through, whether it's the stuff that we do on the medical standpoint, my partners on the orthopedic standpoint, that's kind of taken care of during the week. We're lucky. I mean, there's a great staff of athletic trainers at the university, um, each for each sport, um, that handle a lot of the rehab during the week. They get them taped, they get them prepared, they do their rehab after an injury. They're getting them in tip top shape to really do what they've got to do Saturday. And, I mean, athletic trainers are, are the front lines for everything sports medicine, for sure. Um, so on game day, we ideally have everybody already prepped as we've gone through Thursday, as we've gone through Friday, to say, okay, we've got it as good as we can do come game day. And then game day is just managing what happens on game day, which ideally we don't have to do a lot. I mean, nobody wants their doc to be busy on game day. That usually means that things aren't going well for the kids. Um, so the less we work on game day, the better. Um, I mean, and, and so this is the part that I was saying you kind of branched off. 
Sure. Let's go ahead and branch into hydration. Okay. It's super important. Yep. I know it's you know football's supposed to be a fall sport, but we're su it's super hot. Yeah. It's going on forever. I swear. Also depends where you're playing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, how important is hydration, and, and what kind of dangers does that bring on the field if they're not hydrated? Oh. I mean, hydration is key. I, I kind of tell the kids that you can't start a race with a half full tank. You're not going to finish the race. And so if you're not fully hydrated and properly hydrated leading into a game, you won't be able to perform. There are studies that will show that just a 2, per, two to 3 percent decrease in total body water can have a 10 to 15 percent decrement on ability to function and participate as an athlete. So it doesn't take a whole lot of decrease in your total body water and dehydration to affect your ability to perform. And so the goal is that you come into practice, you come into a game with a full tank of gas, and then whatever you lose in that practice or you lose in that game, you keep supplementing. But if you lose a little bit, you fill it back up. So you always try to keep that tank as full as possible. But if you slowly lose over time, you're less effective as an athlete. And I mean, I think the biggest issue here just recently, I don't know if you heard about what happened at Marshall Baptist with their football player. You don't know still what happened, but I mean, you know that heat exhaustion, that heat stroke can happen on the field. Like, how dangerous is that? How it's super key, isn't it? Well, we always have to be cognizant of heat-related issues, whether it's at the Division One level, whether it's kids playing rec uh, soccer or baseball over the weekend or marathons, half marathons, triathlons, cycling races. So heat's always a big component. Now we do know that hydration plays a protective measure when it comes to heat and the better hydrated you are, the less chance of developing heat injury. But you can still do everything right and still develop a heat related injury. The key is recognition and being aware of the surroundings, knowing what not only just the ambient temperature is, but your relative humidity, looking at what we call the wet glow bulb temp, um, and looking at it to say, okay, are we practicing in areas that are, it's heat wise, safe to practice, or are we putting it ourselves and practicing in high risk times? But you can't always determine when you play. I mean, Saturdays are not determined by us. Game day is determined by a whole host of other factors how we played, or when we played tomorrow night at 6 p.m. was determined long before the season started. Nobody knew what the weather was. So there are, there's adjustments that you always have to make, but you know that with any injury on the field, there are things that you can do to help minimize that, and there are things that you can do everything right and it still happen. So you just gotta be prepared for both aspects. Give me just a second. I'm yep. going to set up another camera angle real quick, now that I'm thinking about it. Here. Okay. All right, so um, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and jump. In, or well, okay. This is a question that kind of popped into my head. Can there be too much hydration? Yeah, you can hyperhydrate. You can overhydrate too. Um, and a lot of athletes have done that. Where so we refer to volume uh, in hydration status. So let's say we're euvolemic, which means our 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 entire total body water is perfect. We're exactly where we need to be. If you overhydrate and you hyperhydrate, that slows you down as an athlete too. And so if you don't properly hydrate, either under or over, you can get in trouble. You can slow you down, it can be fatigued. Uh, now, if you drink to thirst, or you drink to where you need to drink from a thirst standpoint, then your body naturally regulates it so you can't truly hyperhydrate unless you're forcing stuff down that you're not supposed to. Um, so yes, you can. It's harder if you're just drinking, but there are folks that find ways to push extra fluid and try to overload themselves to so they, they'll start off extra. And they're like, well, if I'm extra, I'm good. But it actually, that's detrimental also. That's something to watch out for. Uh, okay, now let's move on to injuries. Okay. This is, I mean, it could be anything from muscle injuries, you know, to strain, to breaking a bone. Yes. How do you guys handle that on the field? Um, like I was sending the email, you know, it's, I'm sure it's a different, you know, procedure than if you're in a hospital or maybe a, an emergency situation. You're in a football stadium full of fans, everyone's watching, you, you, the game's got to go on. Correct. How's that handled? Um, practice. Really, I mean, a lot of us that have done this have been doing this for a long time. 
um, and we understand the difference between how you manage something acutely on the field and how you manage something acutely in the hospital. Because in the hospital, you have a lot of extra resources that you don't have on the sideline. Meaning even when the tent goes up, there's really nothing in there except the tent and the bed. Um, and so a lot of us that have done this have done this for a while, so we know, okay, injury-wise, one, recognizing what it is, whether it's a fracture, whether it's concussion, whether it's heat. So step one is always recognition of what it is. Step two is recognizing, is this something safe that somebody can play with, yes or no? If the answer is no, well, that's easy, then we're done for the day. If the answer is well with brace or with some stretching or with some other stuff that we can do, we can get them back safely and manage them on the field, then we'll try to do that. There are times you've seen people come on out, we've got a brace on a knee or we got an ankle brace on something or they've got a new tape job and we're like, okay, that's gonna protect that. And then we try to see if they can go. If they can't or if we're worried about certain things, we'll x-ray them. There are some tests that we have and abilities to do things that we, again, we're lucky at the Division One level, but high schools don't have that capability um, of having an x-ray whenever you need to get an x-ray on game day. But that's where experience comes in. Experienced athletic trainers, uh, sideline physicians, they can make those kind of judgment calls. And it's really a yes or no. Can we go with X or can we not go with X? And if the answer is yes, without protection, then let's go. If the answer is yes, with some protection, then let's try. If the answer is no, then the answer is no. You were mentioning the three injuries that yep. we're moving on from, you know, strain and, you know, or, or breaking a bone and hydration. Now we're kind of moving into concussions. And this is one of the more, I guess, touchier subjects <laughs> just because of how impactful concussions could be. How do you guys handle a concussion, you know, on the field? How does that work for Razorback Athletics? Uh, same protocol as we do for high school athletics and, and, and every other athlete with a sport-related concussion, there's an initial evaluation. And so in the sideline, if we see them on the field, we'll take them off. We'll either do it in the tent or we'll take them inside, depending on what kind of tests we need to perform and how we need to perform them. Um, a lot of it also is knowing your athlete. If you know the athlete well enough, you can tell if personality is off. Uh, but there's some objective and subjective data that we'll use on the field and or in the training room to evaluate them to determine if they do have one, um, yes or no. Because really if they do have one, the answer at that point is easy. They don't get to go back. And they don't get to go back until they're back to 100%. Um, I think where concussion has had this kind of issue in the past is nobody ever wanted to call it what it was. Um, and back in the day, everybody just got their bell rung and it was like, hey, you go back to play. Now we know that that's probably not the safest thing to do. And so we've changed our protocol on how we manage it. So it really is, honestly, at the time of the injury, it's the recognition. If they have it, they're done. If they don't, okay, then let's get them back on the field. But nobody really wanted to be the one that made the call. And so as long as you're willing to make, yep, they've got it, they're, they're done, it's the return to play that you gotta be smart about. But making the call on the sideline, it's a lot easier than people think. I think just people are not comfortable making the call consistently. And so that, like, even if there's a big collision, like, it doesn't have to be during that. Can you, like, pull a player off if you see them playing a little funny? Maybe yep. they're, they're not, you know, tight on the routes as they usually are. How does that work? Uh, well, we've got a bunch of eyes on the field, not just athletic training staff-wise. Uh, but, I mean, there's six physicians on the sideline of every football game. We've got two orthopedic surgeons, two primary care sports docs, and then our two fellows. And then we've got, with our relationship with one of the other, uh, MANA, one of the other multi-specialty groups here in town, we, they've got a physician there too. So we've got a lot of eyes watching the field. In the SEC, we also have what's called the medical observer. So there's an impartial medical observer that sits up in the press box and has replay, and watches replay. And if they see a hit that they're concerned about, they can either call down to one of us on the sideline or if the kid is not pulled off and they're about to start a play and they're worried about it, they can call down to the ref and the ref can pause the game and pull that athlete out and then they get evaluated. So there's multiple eyes on the field that are watching it from multiple different perspectives, even up high in the press box to make sure, hey, there's something that happened to player X. Why don't you go take a look at player X? Um, it's different, like you know, sports guys don't watch a game the same way that everybody else watches a game. Um, I have that discussion with our fellows. You know, on kickoff, what's everybody watching? The ball. The ball goes in the air, everybody's watching the ball to see where it goes. 
And the fellows are, I'll tell them, I'm like, hey, when the kickoff goes off, you watch the first line of guys hit. You watch the next line of guys hit. I don't care where the ball is. I don't care if it's caught. I don't care if it's through the end zone. I'm watching to watch the collision. So we watch a game totally differently based on what we know of the game, where injuries are more likely to happen, how they're more likely to happen. So we watch the game totally differently than everybody else does. And talking about concussions, uh, this will probably be the last thing about concussions and we'll move on from it. You're good. So how does it, where's the concern from? I know it's, you know, concussions can sometimes follow the players and there could be, you know, like, mm -hmm. you don't find that out until someone's, you know, dead and you get that autopsy. Right. How, how is that, you know, controversy handled and then, you know, why are people so concerned about it? Well, I think we still don't know truly the long-term outcomes and ramifications of concussion. There's been interesting studies with CTE, and you can sit on both sides of the fence of the discussion about CTE, and we could go on for hours about CTE, because there's some that are definitely feel that one plus one equals two, and head injuries at football equals CTE. Uh, there's other folks on the other side of the fence that say, hey, there are people who have those similar CTE-type findings on autopsy, where they've stained and looked for those tau proteins that have never played a contact or a collision sport. Um, and so you can find data on both sides of it, but the concern is we still don't know. Like we know CTE is there. We know that there's correlation with previous head injuries, but again, that was the way things were managed before. It's different now. We've learned, we've adapted, medicine's different. We take care of kids and athletes differently now than we did 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so we still don't know the long-term ramifications of repeated head injury. So everybody just errs on the side of caution. The big worry, especially acutely, is you don't ever want to take a second hit while you're still recovering from your first one. Second impact syndrome is the thing that everybody worries about, and that's where really, really bad things happen to athletes. So we want to make sure if somebody does take a hit and they have a concussion, that the computer that is their brain is completely back to reset to normal before we put them out there to take a hit. We follow symptoms, so we see how they feel. We do neurocognitive testing some computer-based tests, some app-based tests. Sometimes we'll send them to a neuropsychologist to do some neuro neuropsychologic baseline testing. And then we'll follow personality. And so we gotta make sure that the brain is back to where it was pre-injury before we clear them for contact. Now, they can do some things. They can go to school, they can lift, they can run, they can do some drills. They just can't be at risk of getting hit until they are back to baseline. Because we don't know really, truly, long-term, what repeated head injuries do now 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now in kids. And, and, and now that we're talking about concussions, moving into what happens afterwards, with, regardless of injuries, you know, moving on from that, we talked about what preparation's done before. How do people recover after a game? What do you guys, what does UAMS Sports Medicine help athletes you know, recover after the game? <sighs> It's, it's a bunch of different ways. I mean, it's hard to say it's really just one. Um, so for example, post game. Immediately after a game, all of us docs are in the training room. And so we know there are certain things that we need to follow up on because we took care of it in the middle of the game. But there are kids that will come out of the locker room 30 minutes after the game and go, you know, this is sore, or that's sore, or hey, I didn't realize my hand was this swollen. Can you take a look at it? And we'll x-ray them at the stadium. We'll look and we'll diagnose with whatever they have. Sundays, we have another clinic on campus. And so myself, one of my other partners, there's usually one of the orthopedic surgeons and one of the sports guys, we're there and we'll, again, see whatever rolls in, follow up from the day before, follow up from the week before, uh, follow up from anything came in that's new and say, okay, we've got X, we got Y, and we'll work with the athletic trainers to come up with a plan of what we're gonna do with them this week. If it's meds, if it's rehab, if it's a brace, does it need to get a further imaging? Do we need to repeat x-rays? Do we need to send them for an MRI? What else do we need to do to kind of get to the bottom of it? And then during the week, the athletic trainers are taking care of those kids, working with them, doing their rehab. But we're at almost every practice. So after every practice, there's training room again, and we'll have clinic there, and we'll follow up on what's happened, what's happened last week, what's happened currently. And so we're constantly managing these kids throughout the week but the front line is the athletic trainer. I mean, they're doing a lot of the stuff while we're in clinic or we're somewhere else, but the athletic trainers are basically the first line of defense. Forget. First responder. Yep. 
Uh, okay, and, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, sort of about high school. Let's talk about this very different level of football almost. You know, there's, there's high school, there's college, and then there's the NFL. Pro. Yes. What are, the, what are the differences in each um, health wise? I feel like NFL is probably going to have the most money. High school, not as many resources. And you hit the nail on the head, it's all about resources. The game's the same. Speed's different, size is different, but the game's the same. Injuries are there. Injuries are a little bit higher up, the higher the speed the collision will become, so you get a little bit more of that stuff, but it's the resources. I mean, let's take a wrist fracture. Same mechanism of injury at a high school kid, a, a D1 level, um, NFL. Or let's even not even do D1, let's do D2. We can do all four. Same injury, same mechanism, same diagnosis, but for the high school kid, he may or may not have an athletic trainer on the sideline. So mom or dad may be doing whatever. Coach may be the one trying to decide, should this kid go, should this kid not go. Um, after the game, they're going to go, whether they're going to go to the ER to get it worked up or just wait till the next day to see their doc. And then there's nobody really kind of do the day-to-day -day rehab unless they go to formal physical therapy or they get casted or depending on the diagnosis. Division two, you may have more because you're guaranteed to probably have an athletic trainer with you, so you've got that aspect. But you may or may not have imaging in your facility. You still have to go outside. Your team doc may be able to cover games. They may not, depending on the resources of the physician. At the D1 level, I mean, you've got multiple providers at every single game. There's x-ray machine right there. Um, and we have an MRI if we need to that we can get them in the next day. Resources are essentially the same at the NFL level. Um, the SEC is a different beast. <laughs> they got resources that are very comparable to what happens at the NFL level, but there's other Division I schools that don't. And so your, your conference and what your conference has also changes how you do it. So the medicine's the same. The access to the resources is where it's different. That must definitely play a role into what, what a football player chooses uh, when they get offered. Uh, all right, well, let me see. I think those are, I think we hit everything. Uh, I don't know cool. if there's anything else maybe that I'm missing. Maybe some, how are players doing right now? They're ready to play football tomorrow night. <laughs> They're always ready to play football. <laughs> All right, perfect, perfect.